I'm Kirk Wheeler, and this is Discover the Road. Today on the show is Mike Garson. Mike is an incredibly talented musician known for his long-standing work with David Bowie, and he's been called on by Nine Inch Nails and No Doubt. He also recently premiered a work called The Symphonic Suite for Healing in Orange County. In this interview, he talks about what it takes to master a craft, maybe not just 10,000 hours, maybe 160,000 hours. We range from topics of teaching to learning and much more. I hope you enjoy. Mike Garson, great to see you. Nice to see you. Too. Welcome to the road. This is my first time in your studio. It's a beautiful space. Love it here. Yeah. How long have you been here? 13 years. Okay. Now, did you have this built out as a studio? It was a guest house before, and prior to that, it was a stable for horses. Was it really? Mm -hmm. Nice. I turned into the studio, and it's just, I mean, it's 10 feet from the main house, but I'm in here sometimes from 7 in the morning to 3 a.m., just nonstop. Sure. It's a little creative heaven in a way. Definitely. What are you working on right now? Right now, um, there's three or four things simultaneously. Um, I'm getting ready to go to France for some jazz concerts next week. Then I have some concerts in the East Coast, and I'm also teaching uh, very talented music students at a charter school in Pittsburgh. And then I'm going to record for a Spanish artist in New York in June. And then I'm in the middle of um, an album, and I'm mixing <laughs> another CD and DVD for my symphonic suite for healing. Okay. So as we're as we're here now, in the middle of that, and I'm also planning out and starting to write my next commission, which will be a, a piece uh, for autistic children. Oh, okay. So a lot going on simultaneously. You're busy. Very busy. Well, let's jump off right there with the Symphonic Suite for Healing that you just finished up premiering, correct? Yeah, the premiere was March 1st, which was just a month and a half ago. How did that come about? Well, I've written a lot of types of music in my life, and I've shuffled between jazz and rock and classical, and I've done kind of new age things, but I've kind of done them a little more sophisticated. And uh, somehow along the way, I was finding some of the pieces had a common vibe to it that felt more healing-like or more therapeutic or more relaxing. And I was a pre-med student, so I always had interest in the area of healing that way, but the music was a stronger call. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think anyone who's ever heard music finds it makes them feel better if they're listening to things that they like. Definitely. So it's maybe just not reinventing the wheel, but I was putting attention on um, that certain music can help a person, um, let's say um, certain music could help a person spiritually, mentally, or physically. So, or even a person who's not nothing feeling wrong that day, because we all have things wrong at different times, that they um, um, can, you know, feel something from the music that changes their, their state of mind. So uh, I had met this gentleman who was a brain surgeon mm -hmm. uh, in Hogue Hospital down in Newport Beach. His name is Dr. Chris Duma. And he's an amazing brain surgeon, but he played piano. Oh, all right. And his goal was sort of to be me. <laughs> At one point, I thought I wanted to be pre-med, so be we thought him. there might be something interesting here. And I said, well, let's maybe do a big work where I put together a 40, 50-piece orchestra and 55 children's choir, and I'll pick my favorite jazz musicians and classical musicians and an opera singer and a pop singer mm -hmm. and uh, jazz and string quartet, I mean, percussion, I mean, everything. wasn't it extravaganza? And he said, well, give me 30 pieces and I'll survey them on 100 patients. And they'll pick that 12 favorite. And that became the symphonic suite. It's a 12 movement suite. All right. So it came about 
uh, by their request, which probably nine were pieces that I would have gone with anyway. And they, but they found a few that I wouldn't have chosen. Interesting. And, and that one in the show. They chose their favorite tr- 12, and, and Dr. Doomer introduced me to this Parkinson patient of his, she was maybe in her 70s, and, and uh, she used to uh, love dancing, and then when her Parkinson's was pretty bad, it was hard for her to dance, and, and he did a particular operation on her where he puts two uh, pacemakers here and sends a wire to the brain and gives off a little pulse, and it reduces the tremors and the drugs that the person is taking. Okay. So... She was doing a class for other Parkinson patients of ballroom dancing <laughs> every week. And the people who would come who had Parkinson's did better when they were dancing than when they were not. Wow. So I said to her, would you like me to write you a piece for this symphonic suite that I plan on doing? This is a year and a half ago. And she said, I'd love you to write me a tango. So I went home and I wrote her a tango. I think I wrote it in five minutes. And... They danced on the stage, her and her husband, and I made them a little demo, and they um, they practiced it for um, a year, so it gave them a lot of joy through the year, and then we put them behind a screen that looked like this material from the paper there or something like that, so you see this image of them dancing, and then they take the screen away at the end of the piece, and the orchestra finished playing, I finished playing, and she walks out, and, and you see she could barely walk. Wow. So that was a highlight of the show for a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. Like so, yeah. No, just the ability of, for music to change the state of being. It's, That's incredible. It, it's, like I said, it's not reinventing the wheel. You listen to Beethoven or Mozart or Mendelssohn, you know, everyone's going to find pieces. It could be the Beatles. It could be uh, Oscar Peterson. It could be Bill Evans. It could be uh, Bowie. It doesn't matter. It, it has to do with what affects another person. But I'm just putting a lot of attention on them by doing a blown up piece and, and testing it out and making the DVD and CD for it. And, and I have the desire to get in all the hospitals around the world so they could show it on the TV screen. Yeah. And I'm also going to do an app of my okay. music with it. So it's interactive with them. And this is how you feel this day. What well, try this piece and this kind of thing. And, uh, and then we want to put some music rooms in hospitals, just like there might be a chapel in a hospital. Put some music rooms and and uh, let people have a concert once a week. And when there's no concerts, uh, maybe um, have this music playing on a big screen in a beautiful aesthetic room with nice artwork and beautiful sound and great speakers. And then... I'm hoping if there's enough funding with these hospitals, I could bring different groups every week and entertain the patients if they're not in too bad shape. And if they're not in good shape, their family can come down and watch the concert. Or if they're not feeling too good, we have the music piped to their room. That's an ambitious project. So this, yeah, I mean, we're talking my next 20 years. So, But, I mean, but that's a beautiful way to spend them. <laughs> well, you know, at 68, I redefine myself in a, in a way but the truth of the matter is anytime I play I see it has effect on people and yeah. any artist who's worth their weight in any degree knows something happened when you when you perform and uh, I'm just pushing it one step further mm-hmm. with you know being brave enough to say this is what this does but not making any false claims like you're cancer or the Alzheimer's or your Parkinson's is going to go away. No way am I thinking that. But I know that if a person feels a little better, it's got to help in the healing process, whether it's physical, mental, spiritual. Sure. Right? Absolutely. I have a question kind of going back to the middle of that. You were saying that you found connections or similarities in pieces of music. Can you describe what that connection was that felt more healing? Well... I would say, first of all, about 1% to 3% of all music through history heals. Okay. And uh, you could also take music that does the opposite. You know, um, yeah. the army has gone into certain towns through the years and put very low frequencies mm-hmm. out that can cause quite a bit of discomfort and defecation, in fact. Yeah. From the low fre- So <laughs> anything can be used for good or bad, depending on what the purpose and the intention right. of the person is. So I would have to say that um, the pieces that have worked 
through history and current that seem to go a little more than, say, just a good night of entertainment at Vegas or in a concert hall, <laughs> right. which is still okay, because uh, it is entertainment, make the person feel a little better, and joyful for that night. What happens here, I think, is a little um, deeper, and I think that one or two or three percent that does that for everybody, and it would be different music to different people, I know which of my pieces caused that effect, because some of these patients said some of the stuff I sent them was actually um, made them agitated. Because huh. I have many emotions that I feel when I compose, so it's not always calm. So I didn't put those in the show because I got voted out. But um, I would say to really answer your question, it's simpler than people think. Uh, it's the intention of the artist. Okay. And we have to really look at that definition of intention. What is it that you really want to accomplish or achieve? So. If I make the intention that I want to lift my right hand, it goes up. But without that intention, maybe this happens or this happens, but there was no intention. So maybe my hand's going like this, but if I have the thought, raise the right hand, that's an intention. Well, my intention was to, you know, make the music go deeper into the spiritual aspect of a person's existence. And uh, music seems to be of all the arts, the one that can do it the deepest, but it can be done through dance, or poetry, art, film, acting, books, novels. But something about music being in time, that in real time, uh, for me, is deeper. I could be prejudiced because this is all I've done my whole life. <laughs> sure. I have to <laughs> become Shakespeare or these other people. But my gut tells me there's nothing deeper than what music can do for a person. So I'm hanging with it. Yeah, so definitely. So the first piece was a broad one. The tango was written for Parkinson. The 11th movement was written for my grandson who has autism, who lives with us, uh, which is, has spurred me to want to do a complete work for autism. But it will have more songs and kids on stage with and without autism playing together and maybe rap with good words and mm -hmm. all sorts of things to keep it current for their reality and maybe more synth and sample orientated than this show that was more classical, more symphonic. symphonic type instruments. All right. Now, you've mentioned a little bit on the spiritual, mental, physical um, aspects of music and how it will you know, change a person's state. Let's just use that. For yourself, do you have any particular practices that you put in, either with just in your daily rituals that are spiritual? to affect your mental, to keep you in a place where you can create these works? Absolutely. I don't think they could be created without them because this is kind of serious business. And, and, and if, if you're a fake at it, it's kind of a drag. And I've heard some people who are doing new age music and yoga and meditation music and you hear a few bells playing and a little this and a little that. Most of it is very shallow to me. There probably are some good ones out there, you know. Again, depending on the intention of the person, but if a person just going on the um, this, the trend of it, I don't think it's so healthy. Um, for me, it's every day uh, starting out with gratitude and really running down a list of things that um, I'm grateful for. Yeah. And... I've been doing this for probably eight, 10 years. And it's a joke because there was one period of time I was traveling on the road and I was doing it as I was walking in airports. And I probably had listed a thousand or 2000 things. And I had this uh, epiphany that probably was infinite. If you thought about, well, I'm grateful for this cell here and this one there, and then there's a trillion cells in this part of the body. And then this music, and then the way the finger works here and the core, it's, it's, so to this day, after doing it eight or 10 years, I, I haven't come to the end of what I'm grateful for, so it's infinite. How'd so you get started? Let's things. just jumping off from there and we'll come back. How did you start this gratitude practice? What, what brought that about? Um, I think I realized at a certain point in time that the prerequisite for any kind of new understanding requires you to 
realize you don't know it all. Mm. And in my 20s, you know, I maybe thought I knew 80% of all music or 90. Now, 68 feels like 3%, and it gets right. less each year. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a certain humility moves in as you get older. Maybe you recognize the mortality of the human body. Maybe you tried the other things out and they didn't fit so comfortably. Mm. And uh, I think the concept of uh, know-it-all and arrogance and um, self-importance and me, 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 I think that's contagious in the art world. And I think it has a short life. A uh, short life could be five or 10 or 20 years, but if you think of most great artists, uh, they start out doing amazing, and as the years go on, they go downhill, and many of them just die or end up in rehab four times. This is nothing new. Right. So there's a betrayal that they're um, creating not only for themselves, but for their fans and their friends and family. So they're great on the stage for three, four hours a week, but they don't transfer it to the rest of their lives. To the rest of their life. And I discovered this maybe 30 years ago that I didn't want that, but it's not easy. And in my case, you know, not having used any drugs in my life ever and yet been around at all. And, and in my case also uh, having been married 46 years and having like two daughters and six grandkids. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> It's it's a balancing act. So I consider it like spiritual juggling. <laughs> That's exactly. And 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 it's not easy. Yeah. And it's not always smooth running. Mm -hmm. But if there's a willingness to do that, assuming that's how you want to live your life. I'm not saying one has to not use drugs and one has to not and one has to be married. But it, it was a choice that I made. If you're going to do it, uh, do it ethically. And there were times. I had more integrity to my music than my family, and then there were times I had more integrity to my family than my music. And I realized the art becomes not getting involved in either side of the dichotomy, but but embracing both. Wow. But it took a lot of years to settle into it. That's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, it's a constant, like you're saying, I think perfectly juggling. That's you know, what it is, you know. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's go back to your practice then. So okay. you have a gratitude practice in the morning. You know, I might do it when I'm on an airplane. I might do it while I'm performing. Mm -hmm. If I feel that something's switching. It, what it really does for you is it brings about and a reminder of humility. Because something about the way the human body and the brain is constructed is very... Uh, animalistic and inhumane and not very kind. Now that might be the primitive part of the brain and then there might be this other part that's very spiritual and creative. But it's easy, it's easy to go down either path. Maybe it might be harder to go towards the spiritual uh, way. It's probably easier to just follow the um, desires of the body. Yeah. But I think at a certain point you might recognize there's a, like so to speak, a higher self. So so really, it starts to get into the area of of God or infinity or mm -hmm. uh, a higher power, like they say in AA, or like I said, you know, it's a surrendering and a willingness to realize that you don't know everything. Once those ingredients come in, it's it's not a done deal, but but it's sort of the beginning of another approach. Especially since I tried other approaches, and and one of the traps of any a uh, person who knows a lot in an area, and I know a lot about music, is to think you know it all. And right. and you might know quite a bit, and it might be more than everyone around you, but it's still nothing compared to <laughs> infinity. The possibilities. So, right. The possibilities. So um, I think that requires a little work. It requires a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in, clearly. Yeah. I played the piano over 160,000 hours. There's a book that came out three years ago that said it takes 10,000 10, to make a, what, a master of a subject, you know? Right. So, and I'm still going, you know? So, um, and you still feel like you're learning. Work. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And know very little. Yeah. All right. So, 
let's jump back a little bit to those early days because you said something interesting there. You, you never tried drugs, alcohol. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your early time when you first started learning about music. Well, I started pretty early, not that early. Uh, I wish I started at two or three or four or five, but I started at seven. Okay. I started my grandson at two. Wow. And uh, it shows up. Yeah. Something about the brain's development between the first year and 10th year that just doesn't happen later on. It becomes less and less ability to absorb. It, the creative part expands as you get older, but not the actual <laughs> cellular memory and content. And, and okay. All that. So I've noticed that. So I started seven, it was early enough. I've had many students that I've started at 18, but very few of them have that absolute virtuosity because they started too late. They might be very musical, though. Sure. And uh, so I started at seven, played classical, and but I was a typical kid in Brooklyn, and and, and I um, practiced not a whole lot, maybe twenty minutes a day. And as the years went on, maybe went up to an hour or two. Okay. And then somewhere, uh, when I was in college, it was during the Vietnam uh, War, and I found out my, my grades weren't that high, and I was going to be <laughs> drafted. And I said, "Holy mackerel!" And and uh, so I enlisted. In the band, so you, if you're willing to put an extra year in, you don't have to go uh, in the infantry. Okay. You still, as a musician, might get sent to Korea or Vietnam, but uh, it would be playing in a marching band or something like that. I All was right. fortunate that I stayed in Staten Island, New York, for for three years after I got out of the nightmare basic training, which is two months. That was horrible. But <laughs> once I was playing in the band, we got higher grades towards sergeant, these kind of things, they're called specialists in, yeah. when you're in the area of, of, of music. And I got a very high marking from practicing. So I, I, there was nothing else to do except I played for the generals on weekends, made extra money. They paid for piano lessons for me. I slept at home and I would go to the fort in the morning. I was in Brooklyn, just went over the Verrazano Bridge. Uh, and then I would practice eight hours a day because, and then just play a parade every month or two. And then sometimes we had a big band. We traveled to different high schools they used as recruiting for the army. Okay. So it actually took the force of being in the army to make me who was a little on the lazy side, yeah. discipline. Mm -hmm. So it was a blessing in disguise. And after I got out after three years, I kept practicing. It just became what you did. Just what I did, and uh, out of nowhere, I was playing jazz in clubs. I shouldn't say totally out of nowhere, but I was playing a jazz club. Remember, we had our first daughter, so she was a year maybe, and playing this club, and I think there was five or ten people, and it was uh, a jazz club, great, great musicians. And Dave Liebman was playing sax, we played with Miles Davis, Tanner, yeah. and we went to high school together, uh, drumming and Pete LaRocca, who died last year, a great drummer, and Steve Swallows was playing bass, and myself. Um, there might have been five people in the place, and I walked out with $5. This is after doing eight hours a day for these prior five, mm -hmm. seven, eight years. And I said to myself, something wrong with this picture. And then there's the old expression, watch what you wish for. So I said, I think I'd like to go out with a rock band. And the next day, Bowie called. But I didn't know who he was. So I was a jazz musician. <laughs> right. So uh, I was hired for eight weeks and I'm still around. Yeah. After all these years. So That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? But the same night he called, Woody Herman called for that jazz big band. And I that was paying much less money. And I had done big band in the Army. It would have been great, but not as great as playing with Bowie because this was something new and fresh and I recognized the big talent. And then I got called from another big band, a guy named Bill Chase, who played trumpet in Will, uh, Woody Herman's band back in the 70s. And sadly to say, they, they died in a plane crash. So it was uh, probably a smart move that I didn't take that gig. It's one of those things you never know <laughs> you never what's, know. what's coming down the pike. That's wow. Right. All right, now, in that time when you were studying in, in those early years, did you have any mentors or was it kind of the people you've talked about where, I mean, you've mentioned? 
some of the composers of classical oh, or I mean, Oscar I Peterson or any of those people. I had a lot of different teachers. Okay. I had a lot of great teachers. I studied with Lenny Tristano, who was a blind pianist, who played with Charlie Parker. He used to teach 80 students on a Sunday and Monday, and the lesson would 10 minutes. Really? And you had to really come and practice. And I would take trains and buses from Brooklyn to get to Queens through New York City. It took, it was a four hour trip for 10 minutes. And I did that for three years. Wow. And so that was a lot of discipline. I could never do it now, but I did it then. Uh, I had one sparkling lesson for six hours with, with Bill Evans. And I had three lessons with Herbie Hancock. And, okay. Uh, that I had a classical teacher who lived next door to my house in my younger years, and he was uh, a Juilliard teacher. Right. And then I studied with another guy named Hall Overton, who did uh, monk arrangements at the time, the Thelonious Monk. Yeah. So I got to play monk music at like 17 or 18 that wasn't even released or in books or anything because he was working with him. So I was really blessed to study in New York at that time in the 60s. Yeah. And I did all that. So, I mean, I did tons of studying, no less the mentors of the great classical pianists, Horowitz and Rubinstein, no less the great uh, composers from Bach and Liszt and Chopin, no less um, all the great jazz musicians who I love, Bud Powell, Lincoln Kelly, Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, uh, you know, McCoy Tyner, it just goes on and on. And the music, the piano has such a rich history probably all the greatest composers probably in the last uh, four or five hundred years, at least 90% were pianists. Yeah. They weren't uh, oboe players or flute players or French horn players, so there must be something <laughs> about something that makes that happen. And um, so, you know, I did a lot of um, soul searching through my 20s, and at a certain point, I knew I had to undo all the teaching. So now oh, okay. I started undoing it all because I didn't quite have my voice developed. It was always sort of peering. Sure. But it, 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 it was trying to sneak through, but I could play so many different styles because I was a very well-trained musician that I was losing the connection to myself. So I, I kind of undid. How, how did you go about that process? Because I think that's probably common for a lot of people who are on their way to mastery of something. Right. And it's, at some point they realize, you know, the teachings that have come through, I need to disperse. Right, because these peak. are other people's viewpoints. There's some things that are basic to everything, playing a guitar or a piano or drums, but at a certain point, ideas get imposed on you that are not yours. So I had to figure out what's mine and what's not. So I went through a 10 or 15 year phase of, re-examining all that and kind of finding how I like to create music. And it turned out I like to create it through improvisation. So mm -hmm. I created my own movement of music for whatever that means in the mid nineties where I would just sit down and write pieces with a piano that was a player piano. So it was a disc clavier by Yamaha. It actually records the data mm -hmm. and it could play back and the notes on the piano would play it. That piano over in the other side of the room does that. Okay. Uh, this one records the MIDI data. And I found myself writing hundreds and hundreds of classical pieces. Wow. So I was using what I learned as an improviser in jazz, but I, I was expanding the concept of doesn't have to be jazz improv, but it could be any kind of improv. But I did a self-imposed discipline for about six years where I didn't use any jazz notes. I only used classical notes. And some of it was even uh, atonal music, and I did that for a lot of years. And uh, through that whole phase, I kind of found my music. And, and uh, that was a great, great, great six or eight year period because I wasn't... You know, when, when you're out with someone like Bowie, you're not touring all the time, mm -hmm. you know. So if, if I've maybe done 10, 20 tours with him, but um, if you were to take the last 40 years and you string it all together, it's maybe two years of touring. So what do you do the rest of the time? In my case, it's practice the piano <laughs> and compose. And that's still the case. Okay. So I spend more time in student mode 
learning than I do in teacher mode because I do a little teaching and master classes and I do a little performing, but I spend still much more time asking questions and trying to open the door to whatever the next thing I'm supposed to look at. Now, when you're asking those questions, um, do you look outside of the discipline of music to kind of cross-pollinate any of, of your course, ideas? Of course, because music is just sound. And it's a, it should be an extension of who you are and a reflection of who you are. Just like they used to teach uh, the guys, the samurai guys, and they'd have this long thing extending from their hand. They would tell you to make it, you're one with it. And you become one when things are operating at its best with the music. And you're able to say and share and feel um, how you internally feel. And that's when all the hard work starts to make sense. So view that 40 or 50 year period for me as a long internship, <laughs> learning the equivalent of 20 languages or something, and now being able to say whatever I want at the piano. Mm -hmm. But while I'm saying it, the times that I'm not composing or improvising, I'm still thinking of what else I could say. So it's, it's, it's endless, as I said before. Yeah, you're definitely looking down at infinity at this point, it sounds like. Yeah, and it's, I can't even grasp what that word means, except that I sense it a little bit. A little. All right. So you, you were talking earlier about the artistic piece you're looking to do. Can you tell me what that means to you personally? having the grandson my autism. grandson about six years ago was very very anxious and very nervous from from the autism and and uh one day i sat him on my lap right here at this piano on oh, no, that piano over there sat him on my lap and i started playing and i literally felt his whole body relax into the music it was the first time he seemed cooled out yeah that's all i needed <laughs> and it's, I'm still following that one. Yeah. And but I knew that anyway. But I it was very at home, so it, it was very close to me. But I mean, I I seen people my whole life because I played for deaf people. I played for people that were in wheelchairs. I played for handicapped people. I mean, I used to play old age homes in, in, in Brooklyn when I was growing up. I played for sick people, I played, um, we played a concert, a jazz group, and everyone was deaf and they were dancing to the music, feeling the vibrations. So, yeah. so I, I, I've seen a lot in my whole life and it's just back to the same thing we said before. Now you would, if you were to talk to, you know, Mick Jagger or Bowie or somebody like that, you know, it might sound too highfalutin you're talking about healing and they're just out there dancing and singing and having a ball but it, as far as i'm concerned it's healing yeah no so, i see it i mean just that freedom you know when you lose yourself in mm -hmm. an activity whether you're the participant or the creator of it you know i think either that's one that's exactly right yeah um so if you were to talk to someone who's just starting off who's kind of early in their journey what advice would you give them well have they played yet? Have have they? Um... Let's imagine a piano player who's just starting out, probably in their later development, either early teens to maybe so college they put years. In five, six, seven years already. Yeah, they put they, in some are time. They pretty good. Let's say they're pretty good. And, and and what's your question? What advice would you give them if they wanted to be you? If somebody's out there and says, kind of like you mentioned the doctor earlier, like he grew up and wanted to be musician or piano player. Right. Well, first I would correct that it's not going to be a winning game if you want to be anybody else but yourself. So that would be the first thing I'd Great tell. point. Uh, but I could say that imitation and modeling for a period of time is good because mm -hmm. it puts you on the same playing field as your peers, be it if you're doing with classical or jazz or pop or rock or film scoring. In my case, I've been blessed enough to do all those things at different times in my life. Um, so that would be the first thing. <laughs> but if I was trying to sum up and they said, well, we really want to be you, but not you, but we want to have comparable abilities, I'd have to say, 
are you prepared for a very lonely life and a very um, deep life of training and by yourself at the piano for two, four, six, eight hours a day, day after day after day after day? And, and the most important thing I'd ask them, if they're passionate about what they're doing, if, if they love it, that power and that intention will transfer. If they're so-so about it, they don't have a chance. Okay. So I would suggest they do it as a hobby and look towards something that they were passionate for. Sadly enough, most of the planet isn't passionate and has no purpose, and, and that's why you get people whirling around like insane people. <laughs> but uh, no, it you is. get three that was one of the percent of people that are really doing what they love. And that was something we connected on when I mentioned the idea of this is about sharing people who I think are living authentic lives and how can we get more people doing that? You well, know? I've done a, a million <laughs> interviews and, and um, no one had come in with that hook of authentic and that resonated with me because that's all I've been doing since I started playing professionally at, at 14. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Did you, you know, feel like that was just innate in you? Or was it something that developed? I knew it was innate, okay. but it had to be refined. Okay. And, um, but everyone, I think, in their heart of heart senses right from wrong. Mm -hmm. um, they might fool themselves, but ultimately one senses they might not fully realize it until they're on their deathbed. And then, and then oh, geez, I screwed up, you know. You see that all the time. Somebody say, I'm sorry, Dad, I screwed up. I was nasty to you. Or, right. You know, and there's a reconciliation sometimes five minutes before a person splits, you know. So um, I just had that native intuitive knowing. But um, like, like playing piano, it has to be developed. So the, the word authentic, when you use it, the, the word I used prior to that would have been, the most similar word would have been um, integrity, which yeah. has to do with um, wholeness. Comes from the word Latin, I guess, I-N-T-E-G, integra, or something like that. Yeah. And that's a, a whole. And, and when you're living a life that's authentic, there's a wholeness about it. And who I am and what you're hearing now is what I'll be when I'm practicing when you leave and when I'm playing with my grandkids later and when I'm hanging with my wife tonight. And it's, this, it's the same. Did you discover that over time? Or was there a moment when it kind of clicked for you and you felt like, you said you're still learning, and I think that's absolutely true. But at some point, did you feel that? Like right now, clearly it's, it's in you. Like you have that understanding of yourself that self-awareness, I guess. Was there a moment for you that you experienced that? A lot of people uh, who've had various enlightenments from Buddhism and Zen and different kinds of uh, practices, Hinduism or whatever, have these what they call moments of satori or moments of enlightenment. And the, it goes from like they're insane or crazy and all of a sudden they're just peaceful guru, avatar, sage-like. I didn't have that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I've met a few that have, perhaps. <laughs> but but um, I think it was always in me, but I think it got uh, rehabilitated as I lived through life because uh, these things are just potentials within you, and, and then you go out in life and you try it out, and it's pretty humbling that, oh, I know all this, and now life's showing me I'm talking about love, but I'm full of shit. I, I just cursed that guy and I hated him and wanted to kill him. And then you have to take a look <laughs> at your intentions and your motives and say, well, that was kind of mean spirited. And you, you know, you have to do a little more work, go back to the drawing board and examine that. And um, so again, it's never ending. But I think uh, it was in me okay. from the beginning. Now you mentioned those times where maybe you weren't your higher self or the person you wanted to be. Um, for those moments that you were that person, 
Have you forgiven yourself for those times, or is there well, anything that you to, you hold you on to? to? No, you don't hold on to it because if you hold on to it, um, you act through it. Mm -hmm. you, you have to let it go. It's easier to forgive someone else than yourself, but you can forgive yourself if if, if you work on it. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it. A lot of people think it serves them to hold on to guilt because it'll remind them not to do a bad thing, but in actual fact, it doesn't do that at all. That just makes them feel weird. So it's it's yeah. better to just acknowledge, oh, I did steal that 20 bucks and maybe I should go pay him back or if it's 50 years later, maybe I'll give that 20 bucks to my church or temple or some guy on the street. There's a way to balance everything out. So it's, all, it's all karma in the long run in terms of what you give and what you receive. They're almost one and the same. Yeah. Now, you've talked about a handful of spiritual practices and masters. Is there any one thing that you practice or follow? At this part of my life, it's my own inner barometer. I okay. think through my life, I probably examined 50 to 100 things deeply, mm -hmm. similar to what I did with music. Okay. But at this part of my life, I think they were all trying to tell me, um, take a look within because um, it's just information and, and data that you read in a book or a spiritual practice. And until you own that, it means nothing. But what I can tell you is I searched for what was common in all these things that I looked at, these 50, 100 things. I could list them if you want to, but I'm not thinking about it right now. <laughs> I would say that at the bottom of all of them and the originators of those communication, it was very love-based yeah, and understanding-based and tolerant-based. What happened after is a whole other story, you know, but that doesn't mean the essence wasn't correct. Sure. And then that's where the, um, the human jump comes in, and that's where you have to recognize this doesn't feel right, I'm out of there. So... That's how I see it. All so, right. so in other words, I'm, I'm not a theologian and I'm not a philosopher and I'm not somebody who studied comparative religions, but my gut tells me that at the bottom of every religion, uh, there was a feeling of love, forgiveness, and understanding and, and, and kindness. And then, then the politics come in and then the money comes in and then the guy's walking around and put some money in here and yeah. it just goes down and down and down. And some people wake up and some change it and, you know, it's not all gloom and doom. And that's why a lot of people are sort of frustrated with organized religion. I'm not. Uh, it does what it does. E each religion should take care of its own and, and, and clean their act up if they're being dishonest. Some will and some won't. It's an individual basis. But... You have to not look at what it's what the top of the religion is doing. You have to look at what what was the originator's intention. Yeah. Be it an Abraham or a Moses or a Buddha mm -hmm. or you know a Jesus or you know it's just on and on. No, it the original idea and the original, the original intent, idea. Original idea. The original intent. So um, that word comes up a lot because it's the motivating thing that allows something to occur. So if that's kind of where you've come to as an understanding, mm -hmm. how do you continually develop that intention? Well, you have to start off with the willingness to want to continue it. Once okay. the willingness is locked in, you work on sort of the ability to get there. Okay. Which requires diligence, courage, uh, a lot of repetition. If you're going to be an artist or musician, you have to sit there all day long playing over and over, and that takes a lot of patience. It's very meditative in a way if you really examine it. So I can sit and play scales for hours and groove on it. Because a lot of people can't do that, and I couldn't when I was young. Yeah. You just put your hands over the keyboard. So let, let's play a little something. Let's take a meditative break for that. Is there a piece you'd like to share? Not particularly, but I'll improvise something. But that would be beautiful.
that should do it for now. That's beautiful. Thank you for mm. sharing that. that. That's your gift, I think. And yeah, a lot of hard work and a gift. It's, it's, a, li it's a lifetime of work and it's, like it's yeah. ongoing. It's ongoing. Because the funny thing is, there are a lot of musicians, they're always good. They're always right here. Mm -hmm. They could take orders from a director. They could write music. They could score things out. And it always stays between 40 and 70%. With me, it can be like here, but it can also be like here. You mm -hmm. wouldn't get that with a normal, just trained musician. But with an honest person, you will get a wild graph. This was a good one. This would be a nine out of a 10, you know, but I've played many that have been one or two yeah. and a lot six or seven. So it's a very big gap because you being vulnerable and I have nothing planned. Yeah. The closest thing I had planned is I was getting bored and ready to want to play so my hands move to the piano which see. always happens <laughs> that happens when I'm at dinner with people like, what are you doing you know? I have to play I mean that's you know that's what I'm here to do it's yeah. sort of you can't you can't like um, fight destiny mm -hmm. but if you don't know what you want it, it, it takes a little um, work to yeah. come to that stable place of figuring out what that is because you need to want to do something to feel like you have a purpose and you also need to um, have people you can love and love you and you also need to be uh, hopeful uh, as to where things could go. When those things drop out, I think you get war. <laughs> Internal or external probably. <laughs> well, listen, I could talk to you for hours fascinating discussion. I appreciate your time so much. Well, have you asked everything you want? I have one more question. Okay. Uh, it's a question I'm asking everybody that I have on the show, and, and that's this. What's the most unexpected thing that you've discovered on your road as a musician? The most unexpected thing that I've discovered? I don't get an answer to that. What I can tell you that's interesting is every wild and great thing hap that ever happened to me, I never planned. Mm. So things, I might have planned them by having a, a desire or an intention to do something, but I, the greatest gigs I've ever done happen in the strangest, fluky ways. That's what has been the surprises for me. Okay. You do all the work, and then you think you're going to do this, and then you get this. So I'm practicing jazz my whole life from Bowie calls. Now, I did ask for a rock gig, but did I know it was Bowie? So it's not like I didn't have any role in it, but it's very different. Uh, when I got a call to work with Freddie Hubbard for a few months, jazz trumpet player, oh, out yeah. of nowhere. When I got a call to play one concert and do a record in, in France with Stan Getz in 19, it was out of nowhere. When Trent Reznor called me to play on the Fragile album, Nine Inch Nails, out of nowhere when I toured with Smashing Pumpkins out of nowhere, when I worked with Nancy Wilson, the jazz singer out of nowhere, when I worked with Mel Torme out of nowhere, when I turned down Buddy Rich and Sarah Bourne and Frank Sinatra out of nowhere. Um, can I go on? I can go on. <laughs> the point is, th there's a statistic that in my case, perhaps because I keep an openness to my um, thinking and beingness, uh, I leave room for the unexpected and the surprise because I'm not a control freak. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was going to write a symphonic healing suite prior to a few years ago, but when the idea came, I could not complete it. Yeah. So that's a combination, I think, of the willingness to be open and then the willingness to be vulnerable and take that next step. Yeah, the vulnerableness is connected with what I said earlier, the willingness to not feel you know it all. Mm. It's sort of a prerequisite of, of, of any person who wants to study something. You have to say, I don't know it. The beginner's that, mind. The beginner's right. mind, and it's exactly that. And, and, and that's where the humility comes in, and that's why the practice of the gratitude is kind of useful you know but people could do it different ways you could sit and meditate you could take a walk you could run you could um give back you can go do a communion there's a million ways you know sure i, I think there's a word hubris 
Mm-hmm. You ever hear that word? I have. H-U-B-R-S. I think that is possibly a trap. Mm. So it's easy to get caught. I think it's easy to get caught in it. My wife, when I'd come off the tour, would always, first thing she'd say is, take out the garbage. It was the joke around the house. Because it's like, <laughs> it's like you think you're in another place and you're something else because you've been being applauded for for a year on the road and people are all over you and you know that's easy it's actually harder to take the garbage out <laughs> no one's no one's flaunting all over you saying you're the greatest thing since uh, apple pie right all right so fame is dangerous you know but it can if if you have it you, you can use it in a good way the same as money you know but if you don't have it um uh, you can't do as much, and if you do have it and you use it negatively, it's, it, it will backfire on you. So it's, it, I'm pretty consistent of you to come here in five years and be saying the same thing, but from different series of questions. But it wouldn't be any different as a philosophy, or in essence, uh, the circumstances might be different, because I don't know what I'll be doing in five years. Sure. But you'll be uh, learning, I'm sure. <laughs> it's joyful. Yeah. It's joyful. You know, it's not that you don't know inside. It's almost like the knowledge is all there. But in the physical world, if you want to learn the piano or flute, even if you have the potential to know it all, you need to do the work because it's a physical component. Your fingers have to move, otherwise they're going to be rusty. You have to know the chords. You have to know the harmony. You have to know the melody. You have to know the rules of music. You have to know how to break the rules, you know, and you have to have something you want to say. You see? So I played something that was rather uh, dissonant and atonal, except for the last chord. I could have very easily played, uh, if I felt it, which I didn't then, but now I do, I could play something very, very... Maybe I needed to get the other thing out of my system to do that. You see, so you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. That's the surprises. Yeah. So that would be the true answer to the question. You know. Beautiful. Oh. Well, Mike, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank Great you. Questions. All right. Hope it serves some people and helps. Oh, I think it's going to serve a lot. The good thing about the internet, it'll be there in 100 years. Yeah. 200 years, someone said, oh, that guy said something that's useful to me. <laughs> Awesome. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today on the road. I hope you got something out of it. I had a really great time talking with Mike, learning about his journey. If you'd like to learn more about him, you can visit MikeGarson.com. And if you're new to this show or the podcast, you can visit DiscoverTheRoad.com. Sign up for updates and learn more about what we're doing. Thank you so much for joining. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.